Hey guys, welcome to another edition of the OpsCast. Today, I'm very happy to be presenting an interview that I was able to conduct with Max from Black Matter Studios, the studio behind Hell Let Loose. It's an early access World War II tactical shooter. You can find it on Steam. The official Hell Let Loose website lists Max as founder on the project, as well as the project director and the art director. But as I'm sure that you're gonna see and hear being at a new and smaller studio means that everyone seems to wear many, many hats. Um, in the background here is going to be some footage of myself playing the game. Uh, please don't be too hard on me. As I stated in the interview itself, I'm not actually great at shooters, so you're going to see me die pretty stupidly a lot. Um, but if I were to wait long enough until I had enough footage of me being Rambo in-game, then uh, this would come out in about a year from now, and I really wanted to get this thing out. Uh, that's enough of me rambling, so let's go ahead and get to the interview. So uh, I, I just want to thank you uh, again for coming out uh, and uh, having a chat with me about Hell at Loose. I've been playing a lot uh, since it went into that early access, and it's, like, super fun. Uh, oh, I'm, I'm glad you're enjoying it. Yeah. Um, I I have to admit, there there were some times when i was a little bit nervous at that that first closed alpha weekend that i played in um but i i'm absolutely loving where the game's gone it's uh, it must have been such a learning experience but let's we'll we'll, we'll get to that stuff later let's mm. uh let's kind of start from the beginning um so i'm kind of interested in your whole uh like kind of gaming history right so yeah yeah um where like what what kinds of games were you playing growing up i guess yeah so i mean a good question i i basically began playing kind of uh, age of empires one and two um, my dad got me into um you know games and then also kind of by way of that into the 
um, historical side of things. It's something I kind of realized recently when someone else was asking me about this. I think my love of history I, I kind of probably was a bit cut before the horse in that I became to love history through playing Age of Empires and wanting to dig into who these characters were in the game, mm -hmm. um, which is sort of where that all kicked off. And then I think over time I used to play... Um, uh, quite a long time ago, more than more than 12 or 13 years ago now, I used to play um, Call of Duty sort of semi-professionally. I used to play Gears of War 1, um, sort of with, a, with representing Australia in a team on Xbox. And um, I think, uh, you know, I sort of gravitate, gravitate to first-person shooters um, just because they were fast and quick um, and fun. Um, I'd been very, very addicted to World of Warcraft and running a guild, and I, and I really wanted to stay away from something that would just completely addict me again. Um, and so I tended to gravitate towards things like Call of Duty because it was fast and it didn't, it didn't suck so much of my time up um, that other um, games would. And, and, you know, you're playing Call of Duty and very quickly you don't have to be a genius to notice that it's a very quick gameplay loop. Um, every game is designed just it's for t it's for five to ten minute bursts of satisfaction, and that was great. Um, but I really felt like when I played with my friends, um, we may as well all be playing in separate lobbies, um, you know, and just being on mics, but in separate lobbies because the actual tangible effect of each other's actions within the game was so. Um, kind of invisible to one another like you know i'd never really use any teamwork it was so fast all you the, the only sort of sense of teamwork you had was what your team's score was at the end of the game and it was just incidental otherwise that you're all in that same game together um and we started to kind of get a bit bored of it we lo we did love battlefield we loved all the battlefields we used to play you know battle of britain um are you hearing that background uh Sorry. a little bit but it's just it's one moment meal. So we would play uh, together, kind of go to a net cafe and play um, the Battle of Britain, and we'd all hop in the same bomber. Um, my friends and I, you know, a group of five or six of us. Um, and so we'd, while, you know, while we'd play Call of Duty and these types of games, um, we also kind of had this overarching love for games like Battlefield 2 and for Battlefield 1942 um, that sort of really uh, incentivized teamwork. You could play it alone, but at the same time, um, there were all these activities within the game that you could play with your friends. So I felt that that was such a clever model in that um, if you played with your friends, you would have a unique experience to playing alone and have a really fun experience. Um, but you could also play these games by yourself as well, um, albeit a different experience to if you're with all your friends. Um, anyway, so by way of that, um, I started to look around. I started to look at mods. I played the Desert Combat mod for Battlefield 1942, mm -hmm. and that led me to PR, um, Project yes. Reality. Yeah, so... It's, it's um, kind of the, the godfather of all these uh, tactical games that we, we, we love playing. Oh, uh, exactly. It, it really is. Like, and, and I just, I think it was um, Operation Flashpoint Dragon Rising had, had come out around the same time, and I think I'd played a little bit of PR for a moment and was like, oh, look, a AAA version of this, and I played Operation Flashpoint, and it just, I don't know if anyone has any memories of their game, but it, it was so close but so far, and I just went straight back to PR. Um, <laughs> just like almost immediately just the, the breadth of experience in PR was just amazing. And it just really, I think what it taught me, and I think it taught a lot of people, this is that, um, the, the, the idea that, um, gameplay is only satisfying if you can get into it immediately, um, is, is plainly not true. Well, it's not, at least it's not true for everyone. Um, okay in so much as um, the best moments I had in Project Reality were moments that took um, significant amounts of time to set up or they were moments spent with friends doing different things, so tanking together um, in Kashan mm -hmm. Desert. Um, and I, I love the armor um, combat within the game because it felt so decisive and so tense. And I think the big thing that struck me about Project Reality particularly as well was just how terrifying the game was. The scale of the game, um, you, mm. would, you would finish your first game and you'd have two kills. You would never know when you got the two kills. Um, <laughs> you would feel sick with fear as you were going into combat and you're waiting for the two, the two forces to clash. 
Mm -hmm. um, you know, and then very quickly you get in the rhythm of it and you start, you know, it becomes... Yeah, you start feeling better at it. Yeah, exactly. Mm. And you, you, you really kind of know what the sides of the, the, the space are. Like, you know, um, the things you can rely on to work well against other things that you encounter. Because, mm -hmm. you know, so much of it was like, you know, okay, so the Crow Humvee, what's this good against? Very quickly you discover that it's not good against tanks. <laughs> it's not good against, you know, in all these other games, yeah. just shoot it enough and it will die. Um, but I just love the idea that there was actually an animal kingdom and a hierarchy of power within the game that um, unless I had an anti-tank kit, I actually couldn't deal with the tank. And so the best mm -hmm. case scenario for me was to hide from the tank and that actually hiding from that tank was much more fun and exhilarating than simply just um, just hitting it with everything that I had in my kit and that all of us could hit it together and all of a sudden the tank had 15 anti-tank guys around it and it was instantly destroyed. Mm -hmm. um, and it really showed me how you could basically model um, a semi-realistic power dynamic of all these different weapon systems um, within a game world in a way that was fun without one player feeling like they were super overpowered and without every other player feeling like they couldn't do anything and they were totally helpless. Yeah, uh, I, I definitely remember uh, instances in Project Reality where I'm like running into those exact same situations where like even just a, an IFV, like a, a BMP mm. shows up and you have no anti-tank kits in your squad and your whole squad just has to hide because there's nothing yeah. you can do. Oh, exactly. And, and it was just like so creative as well in that, and, and there was just such a deeper layer of thought around the way that you dealt with each thing that you encountered on the battlefield. Obviously, you know, playing Call, Call of Duty World at War or Call of Duty Modern Warfare or Call of Duty 1 or 2, and your way of dealing with something is to just shoot it until it dies mm -hmm. and then we move on. And so just all the thought and the planning and the emergent gameplay that came about um, was so, I mean, I'm sure you, you know, you, you know exactly what it's like. You, you feel like you're surviving and winning and, and triumphing, um, not because you're good at shooting, but because you've actually genuinely outsmarted the opposing player, yes. um, which to me is like a million times more satisfying than um, than um, battling against like an arbitrary um, stat system or just getting particular kill to death ratio. Um, realistically, if you mm. look at those gameplay loops, the actual gameplay is just 0.5 seconds of, um, well, it's not, it's, it's map knowledge, obviously, and, the in, and pushing that map knowledge through to like instincts so that you know where you're going to see people and, and where you need to shoot and at what height you need to shoot. But that's about it. And so to like play a game where you had to understand the vehicle you're in, you had to understand the map, you had to understand like the meta strategy layer because that would dictate sort of where you would see the enemy and what the enemy mm -hmm. would be doing. That to me like really kind of opened my eyes um, to that. And I think honestly, you know, I think I remember actually talking to Rocket, like uh, Dean Hall, um, obviously of DayZ fame at yeah. the time, who was also, you know, who was a Project Reality player. And and um, seeing DayZ come about, like, you know, I think that, I think that if there was one game that's inspired um, just so many FPS, it's probably Project Reality. I, I see a lot of Project Reality in, in most um, modern FPS games now. Yeah, I, um, I, I think you're definitely right. Uh, Project Reality was not afraid of complexity, and it wasn't afraid mm -hmm. of, you know, telling people that you, you can't be this super soldier power fantasy that everybody, like all these other games are providing. And I think uh, a lot of mm. people played it and a lot of people have carried that on to uh, new games now where we're starting to see more of a balance with like, uh, you know, classes, different factions having different strengths, all that sort of stuff. I, th I think that's exactly, definitely, yeah. definitely integrating its way into the more, uh, I guess, accessible game market. Mm. Oh, um, definitely. I mean, mm -hmm. it's it's such a challenge, though. I think, like for for me playing that stuff, I always, I mean, I've always loved World War Two. My my both my grandfathers were in the army, the British Army. Um, 
you know, it's just like everyone is so steeped in World War II. Um, if you if you're from a obviously a country that fought in it, which is most countries in the world, um, mm. and that's always been so interesting to me, um, World War II, and you know, it's 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 a very unbelievable and amazing conflict. And I say amazing, not in a positive way, but just in just in the sheer breadth and depth of it and the sheer breadth of experience in both combat and every single individual who partook in the war. And so that to me has always been super fascinating. And then obviously you've got lots of media, Saving Private Ryan and yes. Band of Brothers and, you know, just the Enemy at the Gates and all that sort of Western canon that, I kind of grew up with on, you know, during the nineties and the noughties. Um, mm -hmm. So that was always kind of there. And, and I always just used to think, wow, imagine if you could make PR, um, imagine if you could make PR on a modern engine where, where in PR there was deviation. I don't know if you remember this. And I found that, <laughs> yes. I found that very mm -hmm. frustrating as a FPS player that the game wouldn't tell me if my shot was about to miss. Um, and I would always have to stay still and count down one, two, three, and then begin shooting. But there was no sort of visual feedback as to that actually happening, the gun settling, um, and lots of engine side stuff like that. And I thought, wow, imagine if you could, like, imagine if you could um, make this on a modern engine, you could do a World War II version of it. Um, it would just be, it would be amazing. Oh, it's all I would play. Mm -hmm. um, I actually... So it's kind of an inside joke amongst uh, Squad Ops staff here. Um, before Squad, which is the main game that we all play, did uh, an update that added a little more like weapon sway and it uncoupled the camera from the barrel of the gun so that the barrel could sway independent of the camera. Before mm. all of that was implemented, I was hardcore advocating for bullet deviation to be in Squad because I actually yeah, yeah. liked the way that it changed gameplay in PR. And I thought that it was a solution to some of the problems that I thought Squad was having early on in development. So it's funny to hear you say that like you just totally hate bullet deviation. And maybe like two years ago, I was like a, a such a, a staunch advocate of it in my <laughs> FPSs. Oh, I mean, I think so. I mean, with all of this stuff, though, you have to like, I always find step back and look at what they're trying to achieve from, I guess, an experience perspective. And for me, bullet deviation wasn't bad in so much as... So So if you were to say to me, okay, um, well, we don't want the enemy... We don't want the player being able to return fire at total pinpoint accuracy after rapid movement. Obviously, you're not completely in control of your, you know, um, of your muscles. Um, you've got... You've got um, blood pumping through your veins, you, you know, you, you've got adrenaline running through your body in real life. So therefore, you are not able to snap shoot super fast as you, you know, um, as you slow down or come to a stop or whatever. Um, and so I, I, I really understand for PR that's that was important because also within that engine, there was other stuff where, you know, your, your shooting would be just hyper accurate. So I could understand what they're trying to achieve. I think the thing I found really hard is that um, it didn't tell me that as a player, there wasn't anything to say your shots about to miss. I'd have the reticle like right on their head. Um, and I'd pull the trigger as a new player and it would just, it would just, it wasn't even particularly amazing on the visual feedback. And obviously you're getting suppressed when you're firing at them. And a lot of the time when I was a new player, I was just like, why is this missing? Like what, what's going on? What do I have to do? And then I'd look up on the mm -hmm. forums. Okay. For, for this stance, you have to wait this long for this stance. You have to wait this long. And so that was really, you know, I, I think deviation in so much as, um, as like something to encourage you to take your time and be patient is cool. And and I totally understand that. I think just the way they did it, I was like, oh, this is this is this is uh, grating on me slightly. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> but yeah, no, I mean, I think as well though, like um, a lot of you know, a lot of the audience for these games don't realize exactly how many tiny nuances make up the experience that you're having. Um, yes. Exactly as you said, you know, Squad's decision to um, detach the muzzle climb from the camera you know, is a, is a really significant decision to the feel. Um, and, and these sort of stylistic decisions can massively affect the feel of the guns in the game um, and your complete experience. Um, but I think that a lot of um, the audience for these games aren't, you know, um, 
th there's not a lot of perhaps transparency from a developer side, and I say that as well, obviously, as a developer of um, Hell Let Loose, as to exactly what's going on there. Um, like you look at the way that a battlefield rig is set up and mm -hmm. there's about a hundred different things all going on to the rig that if you're playing it, you would think the guy is holding the gun. The guy brings the gun up to his face. The guy fires the gun and the gun goes up a little bit. And, and that's kind of the equation of what's going on. Um, but I mean, as you've identified with, with the way that the camera um, is separate from the muzzle climb, there, there is a million different ways to treat this stuff and there's a million different um, sort of um, components to it and each one of them informs the gunplay towards obviously um, a very realistic weapons play or a more sort of, um, I guess, arcadey sort of weapons play on one end. Um, so no, I find all that really, really fascinating, um, super fascinating. Oh, absolutely. Uh, the The... I have such an interest in game design and the way that decisions are made. And I found that the, being able to do this, this podcast with squad ops has been such a, a wonderful way to kind of pick the brains of developers, uh, mm. which has been so much fun for me, but I I've been noticing that you're like, you, you have such a, a breadth of knowledge in all of these games that we've talked about so far especially from like a design decision development standpoint, like that sort of thing. So I'm curious, um, what, what exactly is your, your background in games development and design before you started with Hell Let Loose? Uh, nothing, to be honest. Okay. <laughs> um, I was working in the film industry at the time, um, managing <clears throat> teams of visual effects artists. Um, so I did um, a, a film called Hacksaw Ridge. Um, oh, okay. Yeah, uh, and I did a couple of other um, films and TV shows and stuff like that. Um, and really, I was just kind of um, obviously a big player um, of, of um, games like PR and other games. Um, but yeah, I, I, I no absolutely no formal training whatsoever. Um, I started to just get frustrated. Um, I kept waiting for this World War II game to be made that I wanted to play. Um, I, every time I'd hear a game announced and I'd be like, Oh, this could be the game. Like this could be the game that marries that PR emerging gameplay with, um, you know, um, that PR emerging gameplay with a modern engine. And, and, and I was actually also deathly afraid that, that there was about to be someone who would make this idea. Um, and I think I waited for like three years and, and mm. it never happened. Um, and that was just what I was hanging out for the whole time. And I'm not going to name titles, but there were many titles between 2011 and 2015 ish, um, that I thought were about to do it, uh, and, and then didn't, um, obviously squad, um, uh, and the OWI guys, um, were very, um, you know, were basically, I think, um, probably kind of alone in the market for these types of games. Um, you yeah. know, which which um, I think was, um, you know, I was a big squad player for a long time. Uh, I haven't played it recently, actually, just mainly because I'm so crazily busy now. <laughs> um, but, um, yeah, you know, um, and I thought what they were doing was really exciting. Obviously, it's a modern setting. Um, and I think while I love the modern setting, um, the modern setting is obviously characterized by asymmetrical warfare. Um, you look at recreating... Even in PR, you look at recreating Black Hawk Down in Ramiel was the mm -hmm. map. Um, and the, 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 the hook of it for me was emulating that experience where you are that um, beleaguered um, US unit in the middle of a really dense urban area and you're basically having to fight in a 360 degree, you know, th in 360 degrees as you accomplish your objectives. And I thought it did that amazingly. That, that made me feel like I was in Black Hawk Down. But nothing had made me feel like I was in a giant territorial land battle um, with sort of the blitzkrieg of artillery and um, vehicles and infantry and X, Y, and Z, um, you know, on, on a scale um, similar to PR. Um, and, and, you know, no, nothing like that for World War II. Um, and then obviously I played the PR 120 player game and I was like, okay, well, mm. So there's got to be some way of doing 100 players because these guys are doing it. Um, so, you know, uh, there has to be a way to do it. 
Um, and yeah, it was kind of, I began, I think in 2010, 2011, writing up a game design document. Um, I really loved I did actually injured myself while I was skiing and was trapped in a lodge <laughs> um, and just began writing this game up um, mm -hmm. in a Google Doc and, and looked at a lot of Company of Heroes, obviously, because um, I think probably what you uh, what I identified for my own wants and purposes, I guess, was that um, PR was fantastic, but it was a very, very, very mixed experience. Um, and a lot of the time servers would live or die by whatever map they were playing to the point where, you know, some of the admins would just play Mutra City over and over and over again, which is obviously yeah. the, an <laughs> urban battle. I, I um, definitely played on those servers a bit. Yeah, me too, me too. On the, yeah, the Hog Mutra 24-7 or like um, the Kokan 24-7. Mm -hmm. um, and so for me, that was cool. That was cool and it worked for PR, but like, if you're trying to convince a broader market of this type of gameplay, um, it's pretty important that the experience they have map to map isn't so varied that you basically have every single player leave as soon as one type of map loads or one type of overlay loads. So that to mm -hmm. me was cool for PR, but it was also it also required a lot of effort on the community and on server administrators um, to constantly administer and change these maps to sort of make up for kind of a really varied game experience. Um, so for me, it was like a bit of a design challenge on how could you sort of introduce more players to the emergent, giant, hardcore, strategic, tactical shooter, um, while at the same time, um, you know, creating an experience that wasn't, didn't vary so drastically map to map, um, you know, and so that if you load it in, then, um, you know, eight or nine times out of 10, you would have a similar-ish experience. Hopefully it's a good experience, obviously. Yeah. Um, but that it didn't require micromanaging on behalf of individuals. Cause obviously as soon as you need that for your game to be um, enjoyed, I think it, it sort of limits how much, how many people you can reach with it. Um, and I feel that really like, you know, this type of game there, you know, video games are such a young art form, right? And um, I feel like we haven't really explored the full FPS um, capabilities yet. And I really saw Project Reality as a step forward. And this thing would happen, right? Where like, I was a Call of Duty player. I was playing Gears of War. I was playing Halo. And my friend introduced me to this. And I immediately was hooked and like literally just stopped using my console and, and just only played Project Reality for something like six years. Um, and I would continually introduce friends to it. And I don't know if you can remember how impossible it was to install Project Reality at that time. I'm talking yes. like 2008 mm -hmm. through to 2012, 13. It was I, so I came in at the tail end of that when you still had to find somehow a copy of Battlefield yes, 2. Battlefield 2, yes. Mm -hmm. <laughs> oh man but then even then it was like um you, you know you download like 19 packs it would be from 19 different yeah. downloads it was like built it was like um building a lego set in software form <laughs> we have to install mumble why did that break who knows mm -hmm. uh, and um but but we would go through this horrendous process and all my friends who all you know played warcraft or whatever um would all just start playing pr and be hooked and so that to me said that, okay, like this is not really a niche experience. This is only niche because the gate to get into this is, is impossible to pass through. Yeah. Um, you know, this is obviously an experience that if people are introduced to, they're, they're keen to have, they're excited to have this. I mean, and even more on top of that at the time, obviously, well, even now, um, it's all about just kill death ratio and all that sort of stuff. Um, you know, and, and these guys were playing PR for like 12 hours a day when we were all in university um, <laughs> without any need to unlock stuff, um, without any need to get any more than one killer game. Um, yeah. But you'd have these moments that would just like stick with you forever. And some of my best gaming moments were all from PR. So, yeah, sorry to, to rabbit on so much about PR, oh, right. but it was just <laughs> so formative. You know, it was just like, uh, it's actually also where I met Spono, who is, um, who is, um, uh, Black Matters um, media um, 
and uh, community manager. He, he's, he wears so many hats, but um, he actually administered the Big D uh, Australian server for Project Reality, and that's actually how we met back in the day. Um, and then sort of reconnected when I, when I kind of was looking for someone to kind of join me on the Hell Let Loose journey. Um, so that was kind of how that all came about. Basically, PR showed me that, hey, this is an amazing experience. Um, and then I kind of thought really hard about, well, how could you introduce more people to this experience? And I, and I think yeah. kind of since day one, um, I'd say the way that we've probably differed in our perspective of what we're doing with Hell at Loose is that um, we, everyone always says this is such a niche experience. It's just a niche audience. It's just this and this and this. And I, I just don't believe that. I don't believe that um, the experiences that we're all having in game are niche. Um, I, because I've brought friends in who have no interest in first person shooters whatsoever. Um, and they have an amazing, you know, they have an amazing experience in a game like PR. And so I think with Hell Let Loose, the, the very initial drive was always not to just cater to a very niche audience, um, uh, but to actually figure out, okay, well, if we want this to be the kind of standard for first person shooters, well, then what do we have to do within that to kind of move it to that place? Um, and for me, a lot of that's been about, obviously, like the graphical presentation. Um, uh, for me, also, um, changing some of the way systems work in games so that um, you kind of channel player behavior through reward as opposed to punishment or through variation as opposed to restriction. Um, I've mm -hmm. found that, I think that that stuff is kind of key within the Hell Let Loose recipe and the way that we think about doing stuff, um, you know, as opposed to making things incredibly difficult for the, kind of for the sake of making them difficult. Um, that's always been kind of guiding principles for us when, when making Hell Let Loose. Um, and then also knowing, you know, that there are titles that do what we, that, that if we wanted to make an incredibly um, systems heavy first person shooter, um, that we would be competing with something like Armour, you know? Um, yes. And Armour is, is the bee's knees for that, you know? Uh, um, you look at um, the Acre systems, you look at um, so many of the absolutely incredible mods and content that Armour have um, and the resources at their disposal uh, and, the, and, and the way that they've captured their communities and their audience. Um, and, and personally, I also felt that, you know, um, uh, with with the game that we were trying to make, we also made, wanted to make it so that um, you could play it for half an hour and have have a lot of you know have really satisfying moments, um, and that it was slightly more accessible than Armor because obviously, as you know, with Armor, your play experience it's, varies. It's it's yeah. a task to even get into uh, a game of Armor sometimes. You yeah, know, ex exactly. Trying to get everybody loaded up on the same mods, all that sort of stuff getting everybody together for to just to run a Zeus mission. It can be almost as long as the mission itself to, to get oh. everything organized. And exactly. it's, it's, it's one of the things that I've loved about the, that PR model of like, you can just jump in, play around and jump out like, Oh, I've got an hour. Let me, let me see what servers are up. I'll jump in for a round kind of thing. Yeah. Uh, it, sorry. Mm -hmm. No. Yeah. I, I, I think, I think that that's such a, such a great model. And I totally agree with you on the uh, your your statement a, a minute ago about even non FPS players can can all can find things in this new style of like tactical shooter uh, that you know started with like the PRs and squad and and you guys and because I'm one of them uh, when it came to FPSs consoles on PC nothing I I never really enjoyed them in any way I wasn't very good at them. Uh, I mm. didn't the that five to ten second like gameplay loop of like kill one or two people get shot respawn whatever like it never really appealed to me, but I've absolutely loved the teamwork that comes out of these these uh, new like generation of shooters, and because I I don't have to shoot to be good at the game like when it comes exactly. to all of these games I almost exclusively play as a squad leader because if I'm doing my job correctly, I'm probably never even bringing my gun up in the first place. Um, and then I like to play in vehicles as just like, just a straight up driver. Like I'll drive mm. people around, you know? 
that's so funny. That's exactly what I do as well. Uh, like that's that's me to a T. Um, in, in so much as the the functions that I play in the game um, is exactly that is driving mm-hmm. and squad leading. Um, but but no, you you've hit the hit the nail on the head. You know, I mean, this is the this is the grand irony is everyone wants to, to say to me. Um, no, the really accessible first-person shooter gameplay loop is the one that favors the person with um, 15, who is 15 years old because they have unbelievable reflexes um, mm-hmm. because biologically, um, you know, young people, teenagers, have, uh, you know, have superior reflexes. It's, it's, you, you have to be a real genetic marvel to have absolutely unbelievable reflexes the older that you get. Um, and so I do not, it makes no logical sense to me why, um, the thing that prioritizes a very small part of the overall population is somehow the more accessible experience than the one that gives, it it gives that guy that amazing twitch shooter. It gives him the ability to succeed on the battlefield because he can pick a, he could pick rifleman, he could pick assault, he could pick. Uh, AR, he could pick whatever he wants that mm-hmm. will actually give him the ability to do what he does best. He doesn't have to think too much. He can he can work with his unit um, and he can be the killer. You know, we've all played with people in squad and PR who were just brilliant at at, at, yeah. at you know getting an amazing kill death ratio. Let's mm-hmm. just say that. Um, but then you know you look at PR right, and you see all these veterans, and I'm talking veterans from the Vietnam War, guys in their 60s and 70s, um, retired servicemen. Um, and just, you know, older gamers, um, and they could sit and just um, work the strategic layer, um, and they could find their enjoyment there. And then, you know, people like you and I, um, who, who might have, you know, for me, I was very into the Twitch side of things, but realized it wasn't particularly fulfilling for me anyway, um, and then um, could just dig into leading your unit to victory, leading your, you know, um, protecting your vehicle, as a driver, making sure you're in hull down, making sure that the right aspect of your vehicle is facing the correct way, communicating with your driver, like all that stuff to me, it just adds, you know, you, I think for us with Hell That Loose, we just look at every single new mechanic, feature, vehicle, whatever, and say, okay, so how is this different to everything else? Like, what, what is the gameplay loop for this vehicle, uh, or for this feature, or whatever it is? Um, and then how can we make that sort of as fun as we possibly can and as satisfying as we possibly can? And obviously, everyone has a different idea of fun. Everyone has a different idea of satisfaction. And yeah. I think that we've done better on some things than we have on others. And I, you know, but, um, but I think that's sort of the way that we go about it. And the sort of the thought that kind of always stuck with me is how on earth is Call of Duty considered like accessible? Because inevitably... Um, and by Call of Duty, I'm bashing up on Call of Duty, but I mean, uh, how is an arena shooter accessible when you only, you very rarely have more than one person who is leagues above their entire team um, mm-hmm. every time? Um, so that was sort of, yeah, the kind of the thought process that, that um, you know, uh, I went through when sort of approaching this type of game. Um, I just also want to jump in and say that while Armour does take a long time to set up, um, uh, I'm not. Um, I'm not uh, deriding the experience, and I'm not saying that that is an, a negative experience. Oh, I think yes, it's, absolutely it's absolutely fantastic. Mm-hmm. Yeah, it's, it's absolutely fantastic. Um, it's just. Uh, I think we've held that loose. Obviously, um, we wanted to do something that really, very quickly, um, got you into feeling like mm-hmm. you were playing Band of Brothers. That that you were pl- that you're playing through a veteran's account of any particular battle. Yes. Um, that that for us was was our goal was that you would you would feel like you were on the front lines in a World War Two battle that you could read a veteran's account um, and there are some fantastic um, veterans accounts and books and kind of go yeah okay so you know there are some there are some historical rough edges in Let Loose obviously like you know certain tanks weren't in certain battles but overall the power dynamic and the experience I'm having kind of matches mm-hmm. up with what this guy's saying. Um, yeah. That to me is really exciting. Yeah, I, I, I totally, I agree with you. I in no way meant to bash Arma and the experience. I have plenty of time in both Arma 2 and 3. I love the game. Um, but that's it. That's that's awesome to, to hear all of like this, this inspiration stuff. And I absolutely, I, I, I agree with you. Like I, I, I'm a historian uh, by trade, I guess. I, I have a degree oh, awesome. in history. It's 
you know, always been a huge interest of mine. So I, I know what you're talking about when you, you know, you mentioned these books about like World War II, about being in battles and the, the descriptions that you hear and trying to recreate that experience in a gameplay perspective has to have been uh, really interesting and, and a challenge to be sure. Um, but there's a few things I'd like to, to hit because we're, we're actually like, I feel like we've been going on this topic for a little sure, while. And although, yeah. No, no, no. This is, I have loved every minute of this so far. Um, but I, I, there are some, definitely some things I'd, I'd love to still ask and, and, and yeah, talk yeah, about definitely. as well. So uh, you, you had mentioned that your, um, initial, you know, design document that you started, like was, I mean, it's all the way back in like 2010, 2011, I think you said. Um, yeah, it was, um, I can remember when it was, it was like February, 2010. Okay. Dang. <laughs> yeah. What, so, so that started as a, a design document of, I guess, what kind of like a wish list of things you wanted in your perfect S FPS game. How, um, did it, how did it go from that to, okay, now I'm actually like, I'm going for it. I have, I, I want to just make it. Yeah. Oh, good question. I mean, I think, um, so that design document started out basically of me trying to figure out the logic and the interplay between the different sections of each part of the game. I mean, I think um, something that I'd really learned in my you know career in the film industry was that the less of a plan you have, the more expensive and time consuming things are. Um, and so it was really my feeling that the, the, the more nailed down this could be before it was begun, the stronger the pitch could be. Um, and the less deviation there would be, which would a cost less money. And then also, um, when, when with regards to community and obviously crowdfunding, um, and some, this is something particularly, you know, that we've experienced, um, the more you deviate from what you pitch, um, the, the rightfully more annoyed and frustrated the community gets. Mm -hmm. Um, so that's been, that, that was definitely, um, something really important to, to nail down as much as possible of what this, of how this would work. Um, and then, um, basically was waiting for the, for, for a game to be made. I was waiting for this game to be made. Heroes and Generals was announced. I was like, wow, this could be it. Try it out here as in generals, obviously. Um, I think what they do, they do very well um, for that audience, but obviously not nowhere near as tactical enough for, you know, as to what I was wanting. Um, not quite high fidelity enough towards the actual battles themselves, um, that type of thing. So, and then obviously squad um, came along and squad, squad launched and I played, played a lot of squad. Um, and I was really active at the time on the um, squad forums. Um, I wrote like a really sort of detailed um, squad leading sort of meta guide um, and, um, and was sort of, I'm, I'm not, not going to say I was, um, you know, popular or anything like that, but I, I, I certainly like, I just enjoyed like killing time and, and chatting to um, enthusiasts of the genre uh, on the squad forums um, sort of. Mm -hmm. So I backed it in Kickstarter, and it would have been around 2014-ish, 2014, um, 2015 that I was sort of um, on there quite a lot. Um, and and so um, Unreal Engine became free to use. That was the catalyst for much of for, for Hell Let Loose, basically. Mm -hmm. Unreal Engine became free. That was enough of a push for me to go, okay, well, you know, people make games. It's, it can't be absolutely impossible. You know, you look at... <laughs> You, I mean, yeah, how naive, um, but it can't, it can't be, yeah, it can't sense. be absolutely impossible. Um, and, and I thought, you know what, like I, I wasn't enjoying my day job, uh, at all. And I thought, okay, well I play games in my free time. I, no one's making this game I want to make. I may as well look at trying to, trying to make this game. Um, and so I, um, started posting threads on the Unreal Engine forums looking for, um, team members to join me at that time that it was called um, theater of war was like the working title for hell let loose um, uh, so tow um, and that would have been in like very very early 2015 um, and then i was mucking around and i was sort of making all of these assets and i was sort of teaching myself to texture stuff and teaching myself um, sort of uh, using some third-party software to, to um, you know, make trees and props and all this sort of thing. And, um, I then posted, started posting sort of my progress up on, um, up on the squad forums. Um, and this would have been, I don't know, the threads probably the threads somewhere after to dig it out, but this would have been like 
or super early. I don't even know if they'd released in into um, early access then actually. But um, I basically said, look, you know, this is what I want to do. It's kind of like a company of heroes slash slash PR hybrid. Um, those were the games that I think were probably the most inspirational to me and probably a bit of a dash of Red Orchestra as well in there. Um, what the squad guys did was fantastic, but I think probably, you know, I'm one of those painful people where I think PR had such an effect on me. I really just... Um, squad squad did a really fantastic um, job of what they've done but for me it was always about there was something in PR that that was really sticky to me as a player I just kept coming back to it um, and so I think you know I was always looking at PR um, as kind of as kind of that thing but obviously the squad community um, was the galvanized tactical FPS um, sort of community so I, I wrote about it on there um, I had recruited a couple of people um, who to this day are, st are my partners in the venture um, mm -hmm. you know um, and um, we just started out as a group of two and then a group of three um, in 2015 um, yeah and, and just began working and then I think um, uh, we what do we do we we were, we were working away on numerous kind of systems and iterations. Um, we were seeing all these other World War II titles get announced. Battalion 1944 was announced. Cod World War II was announced. Um, and a couple more. And, um, yeah, just Days of War as well was the other was like the third one. Did any uh, of those make you nervous that, like, oh, no, they may try and yes, kind definitely. of infringe on the space we're trying to fill? Definitely. And I was worried about how much I'd put up about our title on, on like the Unreal Engine forums because basically all of those games are Unreal Engine apart from World War II, COD World War II. Mm -hmm. um, so, yeah, definitely. I was really like, oh, no, like, you know, have, have, you know, have we just sort of given the game away of what we're doing? Is someone going to do this? Um, and But it turned out that none of those titles, you know, none of those titles were doing what we were wanting to do what we were doing. Um, I think probably the closest is after a couple of months down the line, um, a World War II mod for Squad was announced. I think it was, I think it, that was the first iteration of like what what's now become obviously Periscope Games. Um, mm -hmm. I'm kind of, to be honest, I, I I need to go back and dig it up, but th I think that was the, probably the closest thing. But um, <clears throat> they. Um, sort of message me about potentially working together. I was really keen kind of to do, to actually do our own game outside of the squad framework, um, just because there were aspects of squad that um, I felt, I think also I just wanted to, you know, I wanted to go from the ground up because I thought that there would, you know, yeah. there'd be more, um, it would be a more unique experience by virtue of the fact that it wasn't, based on another on another engine uh, another another system another code base um and i like and, and i like the idea that you know we were building something kind of from nothing so um so yeah so and and i thought you know like in talking to the to the guys um who were working on what was then the world war ii mod for squad um you know they were very it was it was looking quite similar to squad in a metagame sense and system sense um and so i was like okay well look you know to be perfectly honest the more World War II, the better for everyone. Um, you know, and I think that a lot of people would agree that, you know, um, post and bringing um, that sort of squad experience to World War II, um, they, you know, they've, they've done that um, really well. Uh, and so obviously, you know, a lot of, um, lot of respect um, for those guys. Um, but yeah, I mean, I think once we were underway, um, we were pretty happy that, that um, you know, the kind of the kind of key ideas in Hell Let Loose was sort of um, that we were relatively safe to kind of continue ahead, and that there wasn't going to be something that popped up that was um, super similar. Um, mm. And then um, basically decided, put a plan together, decided to do the Kickstarter. Um, did the Kickstarter? Yeah, I'm um, I'm actually interested in uh, hmm. the the Kickstarter specifically. So how how big of a studio were you guys at that point? Like how how many uh, developers did you have working? Three. Okay, three. so you, wow. I I mean I remember seeing like screenshots from the Kickstarter and being just you know blown away by a lot of like the graphical fidelity and it it, it looked amazing, and uh, I'm I yeah I'm kind of blown away by the fact that there were really only three guys working on it at that point. It was oh so three guys and then we had a contractor who did the 
uh, character models. So okay. The, okay. I, I didn't do the character models, but um, I mean, uh, since working with that contractor, then we haven't, you know, we haven't really worked with him again. Uh, not not for any reason other than actually just his availability. He he he. Mm -hmm. um, basically decided that he couldn't do freelance because he was too busy. Um, yeah. But yeah, so three, I, I was just like, my whole thing was just, <laughs> my initial approach to making this thing was, okay, so I, I feel like I'm not too bad in from a, from a visual perspective. Like I'm, I'm sort of the, I guess you call it the creative director on the title. Like I'm sort of, um, I'm the incredibly um, painful person who's like, no, this needs to look better. No, this needs to be better. We need to do a better job here. Like the mud is, you know, I, I really like making mud. <laughs> um, uh, so I was like, okay, if I can make a pretty picture and I can put it on the Unreal Engine forms, then maybe someone will go, hey, that's a pretty picture. Like, I'll, I'll have a look at this. Mm -hmm. And that honestly was how the project was born, was just me okay. putting screenshots up of like terrible now, terrible screenshots of Normandy up. Um, mm -hmm. And now since we've, I think we've probably refined what we're doing quite a bit, but yeah, three. So um, uh, an animator, programmer, and then me who was sort of mapping and, and doing 3D stuff. Uh, yeah, so, and then... Uh... Yeah. Oh, sorry. You can you can continue. No, 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 no. You, no um, so I'm 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 interested in kind of uh, how the decision to kickstart happened because as you had mentioned before, kickstarting can be kind of a, a risk reward sort of system where you need to make sure that you're setting, you know, realistic expectations for people who are you know donating and kickstarting for the game, um, versus like you know obviously it can be such a boon to development being able to have that sort of uh, an influx of cash where you can, you know, bring in either more contractors or more full-time developers, maybe pay people who have been working unpaid so far. Um, like how did, how did that decision kind of get made? Um, well, I mean, to be perfectly honest, like we, uh, we had absolutely only one of the team members had any experience working on games before. Um, mm -hmm. So I had never worked on a game. The Unreal Engine was the first engine I'd ever opened. Um, my other colleague uh, had never opened, you know, did, was working as a, um, a business manager at a Google startup, you know, like just not, not part of, <laughs> but, but, but on the business development side, not, not obviously in the technical side. So we had absolutely no resume. Um, we had absolutely no um, pedigree for creating stuff. So in so much as funding was concerned, that was just kind of off the table. Like no one's going to, you can't walk up to anyone and say, "Hey, can yeah. we have you know six Finding figures?" Finding a publisher funding. would be really hard, kind of thing. Oh, exactly, exactly. Mm -hmm. And you'd have almost no power um, if you did find a publisher. And we really felt that the the um, the game idea was quite anti-commercial. Do you know what I mean? Like mm -hmm. um, you're you're talking about like very hardcore damage systems. You know. Um, Teamwork where the quote unquote average Joe can't understand it. it's too complicated. Um, so we also felt that if we wanted to make this game, then going to a publisher would probably compromise um, the game, um, particularly before we even got started. Um, so it was the Kickstarter was the obvious decision. We'd seen we'd seen um, Battalion do it, we'd seen Squad do it, we'd seen Days of War do it. Um, I think. I think looking back, I think we should have almost probably, I don't know. We really felt like we had seen so many Kickstarters. It were basically like a video um, of no gameplay and then some images um, that would raise like, you know, several hundred thousand dollars. And we really felt that like we owed it to our prospective audience to actually build something that was playable before we decided that we would try and raise money um, mm -hmm. to take it further. So, um, in the end, we needed to do a Kickstarter basically out of necessity um, because a bank is not going to give us this loan, a publisher is not going to give us this loan, a venture capitalist is not going to give us this loan, no one is going to give us this loan to do this, um, and so we had to we had to convince you know we had to convince um, an audience and see if there was an audience for this, um, and so that was sort of the the journey to Kickstarter, and once we had kind of felt that okay, well if we're gonna if we're gonna feel comfortable about um, you know, if we're going to feel comfortable about taking people's money, then it, we have to know that we can actually deliver what we're talking to them about, what we're promising them. Um, and so we went about building a prototype for the game. And in actual fact, that cost us quite a lot of time. Um, 
and in that time we saw other World War Two games kickstart um, while we were busy sort of building the fact that we could actually do it. Um, so yeah, once once that was done, we went to Kickstarter. To be honest, like we were all working, you know, we all had day jobs. Um, it was not a, it was crazy. It was like I would get home and like work from seven. My wife was so patient. I'd work from 7 p.m. to like 3 a.m. like every day for basically 12 months um, wow. trying to make this thing work. Yeah. Um, and so even with the Kickstarter, even obviously the Kickstarter was successful, that crowdfunding round was successful, um, fortunately, goodness me. Um, you know, uh, if you actually look at the amount of money we raised, um, you, don't, you don't have to be a, a, a genius accountant to know that that's actually not a huge amount of money um, to build a, something that you're trying to make compete with the AAA game. <laughs> um, mm -hmm. by yeah, c compared to those types of budgets... Absolutely. Yeah, it, it was, you know, like I can't actually even really look back too much because it just makes me feel slightly sick of, of uh, how, how, many, how many risks we've taken all the way through the project. It's just been insane. Like the fact, like, what if the Kickstarter didn't work? Um, what if we didn't manage to get the product to where we wanted to get it? Um, you know, what if, what if uh, the whole thing fell in a heap? Like there's just so many aspects that have been you know, so nerve wracking, um, throughout the whole thing. Um, but yeah, so that's sort of how we got to, we got to Kickstarter there. Okay. Awesome. So after the Kickstarter, um, you guys obviously still were, you know, updating the community, making sure that we were aware of what was going on in development and all of that. Um, but kind of the next big announcement or milestone from at least the public's perspective was that first closed alpha weekend for the backers. Yeah. Um, yeah. And I'm, I'm interested to know, like, how you got to that point. What exactly were you trying to focus on it, both in terms of like the experience you would offer for that first, you know, gameplay that everyone would be able to participate in? What types of things were you hoping to learn from the weekend? Um, just kind of I'm, I'm interested in that weekend. Yeah, so, I mean, to be perfectly honest, something that I knew is that, um, th something that I knew was that we had no idea if um, the actual metagame that we had designed would actually work. Um, mm -hmm. And by work, I mean from perspective. Um, I played the, we learned so much from that alpha. Like we just learned, it, so we needed to release that alpha because um, we'd been working and we, on this, on this um, title, and we needed to show people that hey, this isn't just this isn't just nothing, you know. We haven't just taken your money and run, so to speak. Um, so we really felt that it was important to show people some progress and to let them experience some progress. We also thought that it'd be a really fantastic time to really quickly pinpoint the 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 biggest issues the title was facing. Um, and for me, as sort of the game designer, the biggest issue I felt that I was most nervous about was how sticky was the meta. Did the meta work? If you mm -hmm. chucked, if you chucked a hundred people at the meta, did the meta work for ninety percent of? Did, did the work, meta work for ninety of them? Did the meta work for sixty of them? Did the meta work for ten of them? Did the meta work only for clans? Did it work for a brand new player to the genre? Um, okay. And that was the thing I was absolutely most. I, I, there was obviously technical considerations. We wanted to understand optimization. We wanted to understand the net code, the tick rate off the servers. We wanted to. Um, we wanted to see it all kind of working in sync and to create a baseline of the experience. But for me, from a design perspective, the absolute most fundamental thing was like, okay, so um, is this going to be a fun game to play? Um, mm -hmm. And so we started that, we started that weekend. And look, uh, look, I say this with sensitivity because I know that there are a lot of people, I think probably since we've released, um, you know, um, the title into early access with this current game mode, um, warfare game mode, um, which is obviously um, uh, very similar to sort of an AAS type game mode. Um, I think there have been a lot of Halcyon sort of views of the alpha experience, um, which I, and I understand what players are saying when they say that they loved alpha. I think that what they're enjoying was they're enjoying um, uh, the relative sense of freedom and the incredibly sort yeah. of emergent gameplay and things like that. Um, and I understand that. And I also understand, you know, there was a real sense of make your own victory um, to it. 
um, I think the big thing for Alpha was that we, you know, really quickly identified that there were several things that made the game um, that really didn't get the game to where we wanted it to be from an experience perspective and also from an, an enjoyment perspective. So, yeah, um, I, the... I, I definitely remember games on that first weekend where I would join a squad and my squad leader would just tell me like, all right, we're just going to walk the edge of the map until we hit the enemy HQ. Exactly. And exactly. I was like, oh man, like this is, is this what this turns into when, when you allow this kind of freedom kind of? Um, yeah, I mean, I think uh, exactly right. That's exactly what, that was one of the issues. The other issue was that you were basically starting like a company of heroes in the top corner of a diamond. Um, and what that actually meant was that you would open your map and it was very mentally jarring to figure out what your sense of progress across the map was because it was a checkerboard. Um, mm -hmm. But you're starting in another corner. And so you wouldn't really you'd be like, okay, so that, I guess that's kind of adjacent. And the idea that we had was that it was super emergent, that a dynamic front line would form X, Y, and Z. And really quickly I was doing calculations and figuring that the player, the player density would not be enough that A, you would have any sort of battle beyond four players. It almost felt like you're playing PUBG. Mm -hmm. um, but also that the encounters that you had uh, would either have to be staged in so much as like you would have to, seek out combat um or um you would just walk around every enemy that you encountered um and then if the player density was like that for that then what would happen if you introduced artillery if you introduced vehicles um all of a sudden if you look at if you look at it you would end up with like three infantry per 200 meters which wow yeah that's, that's which is not a good density no, no, it, it, it's a fatal density. It's a density that is not fun. It's a density that certainly doesn't feel like World War II. It actually feels like um, a less action-packed version of PUBG. Um, so that was something that re we really quickly narrowed in on, um, that, that basically forget having a World War II experience. Like, we were, no, we were nowhere near that. And so uh, um, I kind of knew what the experience we wanted to have was basically sort of like, the, the key thing about World War II is that it's not asymmetrical warfare. You, you, when you read historical accounts of World War II, there's a relatively defined enemy position um, and there's a defined sense of a front line. Sure, there are bulges in the line and there are salients and there are strong points. Um, but fundamentally, um, there is a front line because you do not have helicopters um, to quickly move infantry um, around. It's not asymmetrical. You don't have um, a blue four moving through an urban environment as a force of 400 men. Um, it, you have a, the clash of thousands, a clash of tens of thousands, hundreds of thousands um, in one area. So um, call, uh, Red Orchestra 2 for us was the game that actually had done that really well, that had given you this sense that you needed to struggle forward um, and take that next point and that just winning that next farmhouse was a victory for your team. Um, and we were, we were kind of thinking, okay, so we've got this giant map how on earth can we quickly pivot it so that we keep the emergent gameplay behavior that is so awesome within Project Reality um, and, and the reliance on teamwork and all that sort of thing, uh, but then also obviously created a gameplay experience that felt like World War II, that felt like Band of Brothers, that felt like Saving Private Ryan. Mm -hmm. um, and so that was the immediate massive challenge um, for that. Um, and so what we were really doing with the Alpha was baselining different experiences, like where did the game work? Where did it not work? I think, I think for the most part, it didn't work more than it worked. Um, I think that if you played with a unit, with a, with, a, with a consolidated clan, and you played against another clan, and you played um, in good faith, so no one was just backcapping or running past you all, mm -hmm. um, then you could have fun. You could have some great engagements. It, it felt quite emergent. Um, but fundamentally, if you were to put a completely brand new player into the, into the alpha, um, I think it was beyond baffling. And uh, I got a couple of my friends who had never played games like this before into the alpha and said, look, just give me like, and we, we watched them play and it was just, it was not great. It, 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 it went nowhere. Mm. Um, and it was very, very, it, it put so much of the onus of your experience on, um, 
often if you were with a clan, um, which is great. Like, but but it shouldn't be the only way you can have fun. Yes. Um, so uh, you know, I was feeling very much what you were feeling in the alpha, probably, which was okay. So this isn't working. Um, this isn't, or for me, a World War Two experience. Um, you know, how do we make it? How do we make it that World War Two experience as, as soon as humanly possible? And then what you saw through the beaters was basically. Um, us using them as beaters, where we would be profiling server hardware, profiling optimization, profiling the tick rate on the server hardware, um, but fundamentally for me, um, looking at the experience you're having. Um, did it feel like you were having a satisfying engagement, or did it feel like um, you had won because someone, one other guy was somewhere else on the map doing something? Um, and what I mean by that is if you look at like, I think it was beta two, beta one or beta two, um, where we had narrowed, we had narrowed the map in order to in, mm. intensify the troop density. Had it turned it into that lane instead of the big diamond. Exactly. Yeah. But it was still three across. Mm -hmm. um, and, and the issue with that that we were seeing really quickly was that, um, so you would have, you would have that decision-making ability, which we think is fantastic. Like we, we, we think actually that the current meta, um, uh, I think the camera meta really works for what it does, but what we've got coming is another game mode that will basically open up your strategic decision making for the team um, without suffering all the horrendous issues that the alpha and those betas suffered where, you know, we, we were looking at player behavior and we we're looking at player heat maps and player movement heat maps. And what you, what, what we saw for, you know, the, the first two betas was that you basically, you had all these players loading into a game that was 100 players. And that's pretty exciting because there aren't a lot of 100-player games. And when you think of 100 players, you think of an intense, overwhelming, like just a phenomenal clash of two giant momentous forces. Um, and so what we were seeing is we weren't seeing players organizing themselves in neat groups of, uh, what would it be, neat groups of 17 to each defend their own sector of those three frontline sectors. Mm -hmm. What we were seeing instead is everyone hearing gunfire in one location and on the heat map, uh, 90 players, 96 players going to one sector to fight and four players, two on each team, basically winning the game for each other by capping the sectors that were completely unoccupied. Um, mm -hmm. Which obviously teaches you really quickly you know, and it's a game design lesson in that you can't design for um, the absolute best case scenario um, in which you would expect that 100 players are somehow able to equally divide themselves into equal parts in order to play the game um, in the best way possible. Um, obviously, clans can do that, um, but for... Um, you know, a large number of players um, who are also just getting used to organizing themselves generally, that expectation, you know, oh, it just was not working. We were watching games and games and games, and we were watching games between clans, and still the heat map was showing the same thing. All the clans would just gravitate to the biggest action possible. And so, you know, a large part of us felt that it wasn't satisfying because you were basically um, losing the game by wanting to engage in the biggest conflict. Um, and then at the same time, it was like, you know, um, you had never won a battle against the enemy team. You would always feel like, okay, I've sort of won a battle, but how many people was I actually fighting? You know, was I fighting 50 or was I fighting four? Mm -hmm. Or like, what, what, who was I fighting? Who, who did I just defeat then? Um, and so really quickly throughout all that, those testing periods, um, we, we learned what worked and what didn't, both competitively, both in terms of your satisfaction as a player in so much as achieving to capture a sector. Um, we learned about like what the best type of player density was for Hell Let Loose to deliver you this experience where you would see artillery hitting an enemy position. You would encounter vehicles driving past you. You would walk up to the vehicles and say, you know, there's a guy over, you know, uh, there's a unit in the top floor of that farmhouse, you know, 300 meters to your west to your west um you know but until we did that it was a really disparate experience like you would never die from artillery i don't know if anyone remembers that but but no one would get any kills with artillery because the chance of you actually hitting someone and someone being static and for a long enough time for you to hit them was just you know statistically almost impossible mm -hmm. um 
So we learned a huge amount, you know, um, and, and obviously um, the community is 100% right to be frustrated that um, the game does not feel like that um, super open Company of Heroes-esque um, uh, sort of meta that we described within our Kickstarter. Um, I think, though, for us, the decision was, okay, so we're, going, we're about to go into a access. Um, what we need to have is we need to have a core experience that the majority of people who enter it um, can kind of see what we're trying to do. Um, and, they can, and they can have fun in it and they can have this super hyper intense World War II experience. They can also, um, you know, while, while the current meta gets super brutal on the front line and the epicenter of the action, I think there is also um, you are rewarded for, di for disengaging and moving to the flanks and trying to push through um, and flank, whether it would be with the vehicles and otherwise. Um, so knowing that we kind of got that recipe working, um, now we're super excited because we know what works in the game. We know what people are expecting when they get in a firefight in the game. We know what people are expecting with regard to how much artillery is going off, with regard to the vehicles. Um, and so now for us, that gives us great freedom in, in really... Um, in introducing uh, this coming new game mode, um, but then also knowing what the recipe that works is. Um, and then from here, we can kind of start to play with it, start to create complexity in it, um, you know, and really, I think for us, add in those sort of real-time strategy elements as well that will will, will deepen the meta game. Um, so yeah, sorry, that's a really, really long answer, but, but basically <laughs> um, <laughs> there was just a huge amount of uh, sort of learning to be done. Mm -hmm. Uh, yeah, so it it seems like you every time that you you saw a lesson to be learned in those alphas and beta weekends, like you you definitely took it to heart and always tried to to improve with player experience in mind. So I think that that's that's definitely like the the way that I've always wanted developers to be acting. So it's really nice to hear you say it. Um, but so then you guys move forward and you go into early access. Um, were I assume that there was some nervousness about, you know, kind of th just throwing the game out there, you know, this thing that you've now worked on for, for so long? Yeah, I mean, definitely, definitely. I think, I think after the last, the last beta test was, um, was probably the first time where, where we had hopped in and like actually had a fun experience from like the start to the finish, um, of a game. Um, where we felt like the recipe was working. I think with the early access, um, I think up until that point, we'd been finding it hard because we weren't, we, we knew there was something there in terms of the fun, but it wasn't a unique experience. Do you know what I mean? Like, mm -hmm. I think if we were to go the route and create um, a game similar, you know, say like to what uh, Postscriptum and Squad would, you know, have done so well, um, then, you know, I, I don't know if players need a third game like that. Do you know what I mean? Yeah. Um, you know, I think our intention, obviously, you know, has always been um, more on the Red, uh, Company of Heroes and Red Orchestra side of things um, than to obviously offer people just a, another, a, th a third experience similarly. Um, so <clears throat> I, think, I think towards early access, we were like, okay, so... We're enjoying this. We feel like there's something that's kind of unique to this. Like it's, you know, it's, it is definitely 100 players. Um, it can be very, very, very intense. Um, there's rough edges, obviously. Um, but, you know, the way we, we've approached this the whole time is not dissimilar to, to, to the OWI guys. Um, you know, we, we, we really think of Hell at Loose as a, a very long project in which we basically largely because we just love World War II and we love what we do, um, is something that we're just going to be working on for, for, quite, for a very long time. Um, <laughs> you know, so going into early access, I think we just felt that, okay, so um, uh, if we can find um, an audience who uh, is enjoying what we're doing with this, um, if we can strike that balance between um, something slightly more accessible um, than sort of... Um, you know, it's kind of the armors of the world, um, but also not simplified to the point where, you know, you, you can kind of switch off your brain and it's just about shooting people. Um, and then obviously, you know, within that audience, there's 
uh, lots of room for clans and units to, to form and there's a there's a strategy that you can really engage in there then I think that we will you know find an audience we'll find people who um, are, are interested enough in the game that at least they might come back uh, every now and then and, and, and jump in um, mm. yeah and so yeah to be honest going into early access is just is a very kind of to be honest like I don't know if you want more stress in your life the, running a Kickstarter <laughs> <laughs> and then doing beta weekends and then going into early access. Uh, any dev who has done that, I, you know, y- it's, it is very, very full on. It is incredible. It's such an incredible amount of work, you know. Um, pe- people look like the team, our team um, is not massive um, just by virtue of the fact that um, often it can be that the more bigger, the, the bigger the team gets, um, actually the less efficient people become Mm -hmm. and um, the slower things can be because obviously there's layers upon layers of communication that need to happen for for things to happen, um, for things to get done. So, um, you know, a lot of the time, like if you were seeing us like tweet something, it would be like either um, like it would be John or me or uh, Spano or me. Um, Or if you were seeing like someone be tech support, um, it would be, you know, it's, it's one of us sometimes. Um, mm. so, um, obviously team 17 have done a really um, fantastic job in providing us like that extra level of, you know, um, support, um, in, in, um, the tech support and marketing support and community, um, in community support and, and all these other things. But, you know, like, um, it, it is funny at the end of the day, like we're, we're often like, um, you know, uh, the same person chatting to in Discord is the same person also currently placing a barrel in a map <laughs> or like <laughs> decorating a house in a map. Yeah. Um, you guys are yeah. definitely wearing multiple hats in the Oh, big time, big time. Mm-hmm. Um, but yeah, so I mean, I think going to early access, look, we've, um, we've, we've been, you know, look, I, I, I think from our perspective, it's been um, really fantastic. Like, uh, we've been. We know that people are fatigued by World War Two. There's been so many. You know, there've been so many World War Two games, um, and so for our perspective, we're just so excited that that um, you know uh, the community um, seems, for the most part, um, relatively positive, um, excited by what's going on. Um, we we work pretty fast, and we. We um, have a lot of stuff currently in the works, mm-hmm. um, both content-wise, map-wise, vehicles, blah 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 blah. Like oh, there's there's just there's so much um, that we're unable to talk about yet because our general policy is like you know once once it's once we're locked then we can talk. Um, okay. uh, but yeah, so yeah, early access has been a, a massive trip. I, you know, I I, I think I really feel. Um, pretty thrilled with honestly with how it's gone um with the way that players are picking the game up with the moments that they're sharing um and you know we've got a very long journey ahead of us um with a lot of content to come um and you know i'm hoping that um the community is seeing in the updates that we put out and the patches we put out that um really nothing can be considered finished in the map um every every single time we patch Okay, so generally we always keep we always keep track of what the community is wanting, what the community needs, um, and then every single time we patch, we basically spend all our time in feedback channels, just reading, copy pasting comments into Google spread into Google documents and spreadsheets, um, and then we go through, we figure out what the low hanging fruit is. Half the time we agree with whatever's being said. You know, the void bugs unacceptable. We want better community, uh, unit management stuff. We want, you know, wheeled vehicles. We want all this stuff as well. So a lot of the time we just think, okay, so what are the most pressing needs right now? You know, what's easy for us to quickly achieve? Um, and then obviously balancing that with new content is sort of is sort of the way that we kind of run. Um, so, yeah. Awesome. Well, I know you said uh, that you keep things pretty tight-lipped, but hopefully... Uh... I'll, I'll give you questions that you can you can still answer in some way, but I, I do want to talk a little bit about the future of both the project and of the studio. Um, sure. So, what what are sort of the the major plans involving going from 
early access to just a standard full release and like what sort of content are you hoping again not committing to but maybe hoping will be in that full release and what sort of things are you looking to do kind of more longer term as you said that you know this since it's something that you love and enjoy doing that you're hoping to support things uh for a while to come yeah, so I mean, um, there have been some really big learning points for us um, about what what works, what's quick, what's fast, what looks good, what people enjoy, and what and what they don't. Um, and there are some points as well that we feel kind of like a lot of us are kind of artists, right? And and um, you guys have probably seen the, the bloody mud and the grass, and all of our techniques have basically constantly changed. Um, throughout the entire process if you look at screenshots of like from the kickstarter it's it's kind of cute compared to now um i i feel anyway <laughs> like we've learned so much um and so um okay so immediately um so immediately um the 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 i should i should assure the community that the early access launch has gone really well financially for us it's been fantastic um we've been able to expand the team um, we've bought on new animators, we've bought on new level designers, um, we've bought on new artists, we've bought on, we've bought on quite a few people. Um, and, um, we basically now, um, have built a pipeline and a lot of what this last year has been is building pipeline infrastructure for us to really quickly iterate on stuff. There are a few systems that we've need to redesign in order to make them a much higher quality um, and be um, a much faster way of doing things. Um, so what players will see over the next couple of months is they'll see that the FPP hands, so the first person player hands, have been the, the, the current fat hands in the engine um, have been will be replaced with um, photo real hands. We're going to be looking at doing some dynamic dirt on them and other things. Um, we've got, um, we're pumping out matching FPP sleeves to go with all of the uniforms, um, that we'll be offering. We've got, um, just a, a, a ridiculously huge amount of, um, helmets. Um, so we want to basically part, part of that is obviously offering players, um, the ability to customize how they look, uh, in, in obviously a historical sense, mm -hmm. um, to better reward that, that gameplay. Um, for us, obviously, when it comes to progression systems and customization and all that, if the game is not fun, like our, our systems are not going to keep you playing the game. Like there really is a, um, something um, that's kind of nice to have, but the real reason you're playing is because you're actually enjoying the game. That that like if if that you're not having that then you know we're not interested in trying to get you to play the game to unlock something or you know that that sort of stuff. Um, so we've got all of that coming. We've got um, much more robust unit management tools. We've got um, uh, we want to do a lot of stuff. We want to do some stuff with the matchmaking. Um, we know that a lot of uh, players um, will join this game in, you know, as a solo. And if you're joining into the game, you might want to quickly get into a game that is the highest ping server, uh, that, that is the, the, the lowest ping server with the most amount of players. Um, we're going to look at um, allowing you to preform units um, and then join as a bulk um, to games so that you can maintain your unit cohesion from game to game. Got another game mode coming. Um, this weekend we're recording mocap to, as an overhaul for all of our third person animations, um, which is looking, it's just looking so cool. I, I was kind of skeptical at first, just I've seen mocap go wrong and they, we did some tests. We did some tests on our existing soldier rig and I, it just is, it's very, very cool. So, um, we've managed to reach out to the company that has done a AAA, some AAA games. I'm not going to say which franchise, but they're doing our mocap for us, which is, um, which is super exciting. So we've got a lot of that TPP stuff. Um, we are bringing in a new audio engine. We've already started to overhaul many of the assets, um, within the game. I think audio is probably the place where we've, um, where we artistically need to push forward the most. Um, and really tighten that up. Um, oh gosh, there's so much. Um, 
<laughs> more effects. We've got technical artists optimizing stuff. We are building new 3D models and assets every day. Our library now of like 1940s France is now pretty extensive. Mm -hmm. um, we ha <clears throat> um, are just reaching a battle rhythm um, to produce a new map within a certain period of time that's quite fast. Um, uh, which will mean that we've currently got two maps underway that haven't been announced yet. Um, one of them is a backer map. Um, uh, and we think both of those are going to be, um, we want to do them because we just think it's going to be sick. Like we just, we want to do them <laughs> because we're like, man, like, you know, I think people know what the hell that loose recipe is now. It's like these really intense um, infantry battles with supporting armor with artillery, with the commander call-ins. Um, so, you know, think of the most iconic battles of World War II, uh, and that to us is kind of exciting to have a go at them. Um, so right now what we're doing is dialing up. We want to basically have a minimum of eight maps um, on the Western Front before we come out of early access. And when we come out of early access, we want to have um, more than two maps on the Eastern Front. Um, okay. And at least a commensurate array of equipment roles, vehicles for that Eastern Front as well. That's, that's, that's right now, that's the goal. Um, and the systems that we've been developing will allow us to iterate that out relatively fast. Um, I'd say the maps are, the, are, are you know, um, are really time intensive and, and super um, creativity intensive. Um, but we feel like we've got a pretty good handle on, um, on creating them and also, and also sort of the philosophy that we apply when we come to mapping and creating a map in Let Loose. Um, you know, we really try and think about what we're offering that's new to the player in the map that they ha that you haven't just played before. Um, cause we're not super interested in churning out, you know, another San Marie de Mont or another Utah beach or another foil or what, what have you every single time you have to see something different um, that you've never seen before. Yeah. It's kind of a feeling. Um, so there's a whole bunch of stuff. Um, generally systems, the UI, the HUD, all of that is getting um, a slow overhaul. Um, there are two endemic bugs right now that have been driving us insane, but that we've been deep diving for the last couple of weeks and think we're, we've um, uh, most likely got a solution for that's obviously the proximity that the not proximity chat the um, VoIP bug um, and then also the server browser not revealing all your servers issue mm -hmm. as well those are those are two really critical things that we need to fix um, so yeah it's a real combination of bug fixing of bringing in new features of expanding those features um, we've got a battle tempo for mapping um, that uh, we've just hit that's pretty good that will mean that you uh, I don't know how much I can say without getting in trouble but um, it would be something like oh how much can I say uh, you, you don't have to feel pressured like you need to say anything no, if it's going um, to get you in trouble because I, I, I don't want that I just don't want to say something that the community then say, hey, you know, you, like what's going on? You didn't meet these expectations this? Exactly, now. exactly. Yeah. We're, we're, we're aiming for, let's say we're aiming for a map um, every couple of months. Okay. Um, on the, on the, let's say that's on the slower end of the spectrum. Mm -hmm. um, you know, so, um, yeah, we, we, there's, just, there's just so much coming. I mean, we want to do a couple of new, more weapons as well. I think the grease gun would be quite a fun addition to the American side of things. Mm -hmm. um, the uh, FG-42, MG-34, Panzer, Faust, stuff like that. Obviously, we've got basically going to have a vehicle every update, vehicles every update, new vehicles. Yeah. Um, the commander will get a lot of TLC in so much as like, his interface right now is horrible. Just... It is basically a placeholder. Um, there's a lot that we can do there. Um, we're going to expand his array of abilities um, to make them uh, richer, deeper. Um, we really think that um, sort of the kind of Company of Heroes-esque like sort of supply drop stuff is really fun and, and kind of 
Um, we're really happy with how that's working in so much as players are noticing where those are happening and then they're making gameplay decisions based on where they're seeing, you know, sort of parachutes land, mm -hmm. um, which we really like. Um, so, yeah, it's, I think it's about expanding the recipe. It's about polishing what's there. We're going to introduce unit locking, unit kicking. Um, we're going to look at rebalancing the armor units so that there's more armor units, but there's three men in them. Um, yeah, and then and then all the while expanding um, systems and polishing systems. Uh, we want to do bullet penetration. Um, we're going to increase the bullet travel time on the weapons. Right now, that's too fast. Um, a lot of people have obviously have obviously said that um, they would like like it to be much slower, mm -hmm. much more um, closer to the real equivalent. Um, so yeah, I don't know. There's just uh, there's, that's there's that's, just a lot. That's a big list. And flamers, uh, flamers. We're very excited for flamers. That's going to be oh, fun. Okay. Think um, Rising Storm Two, Red Orchestra, uh, Rising Storm One, like that. That's what we're looking at um, for that sort of experience. They're going to be very potent. Um, weapon within 40 meters mm -hmm. um, and good for you know it's almost like a it almost has the same functionality as a grenade in that you're clearing you're using indirect fire to clear a position yeah um, so all that stuff like it's just so much that we want to do and and we're in this for years you know um, and then we're also looking at um, where the title might go after that um, so I, I really can't say stuff about that uh, or I would get it a lot in trouble. But, um, you know, look, the game is the game's quite optimized. I know that obviously people have, obviously, I, you know, there's room for me to get uh, hung, drawn and quartered for saying that. But mm -hmm. um, we, we're continually pushing the optimization. So the optimization is going to continually improve. Um, but the net code as well is, is quite optimized. Um, and so it will be interesting to see what the future holds. Um, but yeah, I mean, for us, you know, in the meantime, we're really enjoying, you know, we're, we're loving what we're doing. We're having a lot of fun. We're watching, we're reading Reddit, we're reading Discord, reading the forums. Um, you know, uh, we're kind of everywhere. We, we largely agree with the most, you know, with the majority of the criticisms of the title at the moment. Um, and, and, you know, we're really as excited as the community to, to widen it out. Um, yeah, this is, it's just, I mean, I'm happy to answer more specific, more specific stuff than that. Um, uh, yeah, there's I, I don't really have anything too more specific than that. You, I mean, you've covered a lot of the things that I was interested in, in terms of, you know, what the priorities were and that sort of thing. And I, I feel like on most titles especially ones in early access and still in active development that you know optimization is always something that's in a tug of war with new features you know yes versus, like, yep. bug fixing and all that sort of stuff but i'm curious because uh i heard a lot of things that are you know in pipelines or on the way um mm. if you could give me like i i'm curious to know i'm sure you're not still at just three developers right oh no no not at all <laughs> no 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 yeah, yeah, yeah. sorry <laughs> <laughs> after the Kickstarter, so after the Kickstarter, um, we went up to around seven, um, and then through to, and then, so seven, and then, but then um, we've also had like um, five to, it's kind of hard to quantify it exactly, but about five to 10 contractors probably. Um, but while we'll have a business relationship with a contractor for only a couple of months or whatever, um, you know, we kind of consider them, um, to be part of the team, but I wouldn't list them as sort of a day-to-day -day person. Like, uh, you know, there have been contractors who we're great friends with who, you know, we'll always pull them into like test a feature or you know, close feature or whatever, um, but they may not have done work for us for like a year. Um, mm. So, um, but now we are, it's, it is kind of hard to say, now we're like more than 15 people um, and then contractors on top as well um okay yeah so um you know I, i'm a pretty risk averse person and i want to make sure obviously that we're financially responsible um and that we can i mean to be perfectly honest it's just an extension of the kickstarter like we have to have the resources that we need to continue making this game um to continue polishing this game um from from our perspective hell at loose is only done when 
when we feel we sit back and we go, what else can we add? And we have to rack our brains as to what we can add. Um, you know, so it, it, we're looking at years. Um, once Kickstart, once once we leave early access, I think we're probably just going to be using the same sort of um, update cycle that we've used during early access, um, looking at a significant update every six weeks with patches in between. Um, we really like working fast. We really like the community being able to give us really quick, fresh feedback. Um, and so much as risk now for us is concerned, there's not a huge amount of risk left. I think probably the biggest risk left to us in so much as from, you know, just from a technical perspective I'm talking about is um, making sure that the wheeled vehicles perform well um, under like 100 player server stress loads. Mm -hmm. um, in a lot of battles, obviously, we are basically having to t send information to you, the player, about 99 other people um, within 400 meters of you. Um, and so when you include like complex physics bodies, you know, with suspension, um, and, and a physics model running on them that can that can get expensive. So um, we've just been very cautious about that. We don't want to introduce anything that you know breaks the experience at the moment. So, uh, but otherwise, you know, I think that the, the hard stuff for us was with the tanks, um, making sure obviously that we can run a hundred players every single game, every single time, um, for two hours, um, and yeah, that, that sort of stuff. So I think a lot of the stuff that scared us most is now. You know, we kind of know what that looks like. Um, I think it's now just about smashing those final bugs that, is, that are annoying absolutely everyone, stuff like the VoIP and, and the server browser stuff. And then once that's done, um, just continuing to watch the experience. I mean, and it really feels cumulative. It's like, okay, so we've introduced this and we see this bug in our QA process. Okay, well, we know what's causing that because that happened, you know, that's come about in the last two weeks and we've done this in the last two weeks. Um, so we're very fortunate that Team 17 um, has, has really um, got such a fantastic, um, you know, QA process that has really helped us, you know, um, you know, kind of achieve what's been achieved so far, if you want to put it that way, um, but also just helps us to keep, um, keep the bugs down to a, to a, to a controllable amount. Mm -hmm. um, yeah. Awesome. Well, uh, we've definitely gone a little over time for what I was. I'm so sorry. I've hey, been that's no. Here, here I I could, I could hear you talk about this for for forever. I'm so interested in games development and games design, <laughs> so I'm I'm absolutely fascinated by everything we've talked about. So we'll start wrapping it up. But I always have a, a question that I like to ask developers, um, and that is just say uh, you're talking to someone who's interested in kind of a similar thing as you he's got this idea in his head he or she has this idea in his head of a game and they have no idea where to start like what what are some like maybe one or two of the major lessons you've learned along the way that you would want to impart to somebody who is who wants to start building a game um i think that i think the first one is a really hard lesson in that um I think a lot of this stuff is just decided by how determined you are and how, and how, you, if, if if you're relatively prepared to stick at something for more for years at a time, um, I think your chance of achieving it kind of goes up over time just because you actually get quite good at what you're doing for years. I think it's unusual for someone to stick at something for years and not actually get quite good at what they are doing. Um, so even if you know if if you have an idea for a game. Um, Hopping in Unreal Engine, which is you know completely free to use, um, and, and just working at it and learning the systems and, and beginning to understand it, like um, the best case scenario at the end of the day is you're able to release a game to to uh, hopefully an audience of people who are interested in in kind of what you've made. Um, and the worst case scenario is you've probably taught yourself some some skills and some tools that would let you join a team or let you get employment within the games industry. Um, you know, and begin on that path. And maybe, maybe you're not making your own game first, um, but you certainly, your knowledge is certainly valuable to someone. And so I really recommend that people um, grab a game engine. Um, they start chipping away at it. It feels very difficult. It feels impossible. Um, but know that people have gone before you and there's some fantastic uh, documentation online and there's some fantastic people who are willing to share their wisdom with you. Um, and, and I recommend joining Unreal Engine Discord groups and forums and, 
ask questions and chat. You can find questions I asked on on the Unreal Engine forums back in 2014 about how to put down a road and stuff like that. You know, if you if you look hard enough. <laughs> um, so uh, it, you know, at the at worst case scenario is you're going to come away with some skills that would let you join and be a productive, really productive um, artist or developer within the within um, the video games industry. Um, and then I think, um, in so much as game design is concerned, if you're, you, maybe you're really passionate about making a game, but you're not sure what game to make. Um, I recommend, um, taking actually it's a screenwriting tip. Uh, and the screenwriting tip was, um, uh, from a really famous screenwriter, um, his name escapes me, but basically he said, watch a film, watch one of your favorite films and then think how you could make that better. Um, think about the rough edges on that film because there's always a rough edge um, and think about what you would do to change that and so to that I'd say think about um, your favorite games and think about what would take that experience further what would make that experience better what would keep you playing longer what would make you have more fun what would be something interesting that you hadn't seen in that game before um, and, and I think by by looking at games critically in that sense um, you refine you refine your thinking in order to figure out okay well well what could actually be quite fun what what would actually um, give players something new or give them you know a, a different experience of something that they're familiar with or um, you know something like that and I think that is um, sort of the way we've approached Hell Let Loose I don't think what we're doing is hyper unique in any sense of the word but um, you know I think we're always trying to figure out okay well what could be quite a fun way of doing this. Um, so that would be those would be my tips, I think. And then I think if you're starting out, choose a game that you could that you could start to make. <laughs> and I say this out of like pain and experience. Choose a game that you do not need a team of like a hundred people and seventy million dollars to make, um, <laughs> because that is going to be a lot of work. Um, you know, I think looking at games like um, games with really clever gameplay loops. Um, that are simple but that just grab you, those are the, those are the games to look at first. Uh, and then from there, sort of work your way up. Awesome. Well, I want to thank you again for uh, taking the time aside to, to talk to me about, obviously, just development and, and the game itself. Uh, it's, it's, it's been really fun and interesting and fascinating watching this develop from a Kickstarter to where you're at now and seeing how successful it's been. So yeah, I just want to thank you for, for coming out. Oh, thanks so much. Thanks so much for having me. And thanks for letting me talk your ear off. Um, <laughs> but no, I know I'd like, yeah, like you, I could just talk about this stuff all day. Um, but yeah, no, th thanks so much for being interested. Thanks to anyone who listens to this, um, you know, for being interested in what, uh, in the way that we're working on hell let loose um and yeah i'm just excited to show everyone what's coming in the future but um thank you very much thanks all right all right guys thanks for coming out i want to thank max again for taking some time out of what i know is a very busy schedule to indulge me for this interview and uh, i definitely want to urge you guys to go ahead and check this game out again you can find it on steam in early access a uh, game is called hell let loose um, these are some awesome devs. They really care about this game, and I'm really looking forward to what's coming from them. Uh, it's definitely, it's it's already a super fun game. And uh, as you've heard, there's a lot more coming down the pipeline that's just going to make it even better. And uh, yeah, that's it, guys. Thanks again for coming out, and I'll catch you guys on the next OpsCast.